So I was going to go ahead and screen share the presentation. Uh, does that work for you guys? Yeah, that's perfect. All right, might as well get that sorted out then. And... Be able to run the tests and be able to run invariants. And feel free to drop questions in the chat. Uh, we'll uh, have time for that as well. In fact, I reckon we are good to kick off. I'll hand things over to Alex and Dap. All right, Alex, you want to kick us off? Amazing. Thank you for having us. Um, protocol, we have uh, a few familiar faces in the audience as well. DAP is effectively, I guess you would call them a CTO of the Badger, and he led the development of the project. And uh, uh, in this presentation, we'll help you uh, understand what the project is about and hopefully give you tips on uh, things you want to check during the upcoming contest or EBTC. Uh, Dap, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. Excited to be presenting in the Code Arena Discord. We've ran a number of contests. It's great, you know, seeing everyone being part of the community. Um, yeah, I think Alex introduced me in my role at Badger, and yeah, it's really excited to present you guys EBTC. Um, we think it's a pretty interesting new protocol. And uh, as with most, uh, um, as with uh, uh, most, uh, uh, I guess the way you will define EBTC is, is a, a Bitcoin-based stablecoin. It's effectively similar to a dollar stablecoin, but instead of targeting the price of a dollar, it's going to price the, the tar, uh, the, it's going to target the price of Bitcoin. Uh, it's based on the liquidity model. So if you're familiar with liquidity, most of the things we're going to say in the next uh, few minutes are going to be very familiar to you. And uh, due to the close relation between BTC and ETH, um, uh, BTC allows a 110% collateralization ratio as the minimum which means that uh, for every dollar of debt that you borrowed, so for every dollar of BTC you minted, you have to have at least 100 uh, or 1.1, um, so 1.1 times uh, as much debt, uh, sorry, as much collateral uh, borrowed. Um, interestingly enough, the main collateral for the system is STEF, which means that uh, um, they are technically self-repaying loans. And uh, due to that, there is no cost in borrowing. The cost is actually deducted as a fee uh, on the yield share side. Uh, there, there should be a second slide. Yeah, and so uh, going back to kind of the liquidity tweaks, uh, liquidity has a recovery mode at 150%, whereas uh, for EBTC, the recovery mode is triggered at 125%. Uh, we've done uh, economic research with risk DAO in order to validate uh, these parameters. And another interesting parameter is the gas stipend for liquidations. Liquidations are um, uh, paid by a 0.2 STF, uh, so uh, 117 STF stipend, which means that they're going to be uh, profitable or at least they're going to be paid um, uh, up to 1,000 guay. So if a liquidation costs 200,000 gas, uh, it's still going to be profitable to execute even at uh, 1,000 way. And then uh, the system offers both partial and dynamic, uh, liqu uh, sorry, uh, partial and full liquidations. And they have a dynamic premium, which is meant to reduce the bad debt to the system while still offering uh, a profitable premium uh, to the uh, liquidators. Yeah, so, you know, while we started with Liquidity as a base and we we're really inspired by a lot of the design and thorough research they did, we also wanted to kind of rethink each aspect of the protocol from first principles as well and question it, right? So before we can dig into those key changes, I could go over like the summary of what changed. As Alex already mentioned, this is LST5. We use STE as collateral. We take a fee on that yield, um, that yield split. And so interestingly, we have to have handle both like positive and negative rebase scenarios gracefully. 
Um, we added flash loans to the system for both EBTC, um, uncapped flash minting, and SDE based on, of course, the collateral available. Um, we added a way to, while CDPs are owned and non-transferable, we do offer a way for other accounts to be allowed to perform delegated oper operations on the behalf of the users. And I can go into some of what the key use cases that enables are later. Um, we moved from the stability pool model to having free market liquidations with a dynamic premium to in a more classical incentive there. Um, there's a grace period for recovery mode for the time at which the, the rules switch. You know, Alex mentioned the rules that you know typically the, the, the MCR or minimum collateralization is 110. When the system gets to this certain emergency low health status, that bumps up to 125. And yeah, you know, he can explain the reasoning behind that. And then we also rethought like, what are the key things that have to be immutable for this protocol for it to be you know truly decentralized and censorship resistant? And what can we play with as far as governance features to allow it to uh, adapt to the the changing market? Um, and so on the redemption side, if you're familiar with Liquid, you're familiar with this, it's a peg stability mechanic, right? You can bring one EBTC back to the protocol and redeem one BTC worth of SDETH as reported by the system Oracle, you know, regardless of what the on-chain pools are doing, uh, minus the fees, right? And so this has a fee that scales based on redemption volume in a time period into Ks to try to like rate limit the redemptions um, and really to, you know, restore confidence in the protocol without doing kind of the undesirable change to users while, you know, doing a, having a redeem, redemption on your position is a neutral value operation in theory. It's not necessarily what people want, right? So it's not a good user experience. And so like liquidity, the way we modulate this is that the, the riskiest positions get redeemed against first, which also is the side benefit of increasing the collateralization ratio um, as things get redeemed. So the implementation is the same, but you know some parameters are now governable to respond to market dynamics, but we did make sure to have a hard-coded minimum fee in there. And so, okay, we have this concept of ordering CDPs, right? This is enforced by a sorted length list um, from you know lowest ICR to highest ICR. And one kind of quirk of the system from this is because linked list, middle insertion, you know, is an order in operation. Um, if you start from the ends, we have to provide kind of hints of like where the CDP should go, like should we go go between X and Y place to get that efficiency optimized, right? And that's really important for on-chain operations. And so this is something you'll see throughout the code base is like anytime we're reinserting a CDP or inserting a CDP into the list, um, these hints are, are used for that. Yeah, when it comes uh, to the liquidation system, as I mentioned, um, there's uh, been some interesting changes the way I like to think of it is a four by four grid. We effectively have either the liquidation of uh, healthy CDPs, especially in uh, recovery mode. And so these CDPs will generate no bad debt. And that type of liquidation can either be total, as in it's a full liquidation, it's going to close the CDP, or it could be a partial liquidation, uh, which could be helpful in the case of having a very big CDP or uh, in case that uh, there's not enough liquidity to um, safely close the entire position. And so uh, the partial liquidations are uh, fairly straightforward. They simply uh, will not close the CDP. They're not going to cause a redistribution of bad debt. And the minimum CDP size is uh, true SDE. So any liquidation that keeps the CDP above that size is partial, whereas a total or a full liquidation uh, would actually close the CDP. And uh, based, uh, um, we basically added this uh, interesting uh, dynamic, which was introduced by the ZeroVix uh, team, uh, which is the idea of having a dynamic premium, which on one end means that it's uh, competitive for a liquidator to perform as an operation, but at the same time, it minimizes the bad debt that the system locks in. And so as the ICR, as the internal collateralization ratio of a CDP decreases, the premium for that liquidation decreases, but it's gonna be kept at a minimum of 3%, meaning that uh, even those liquidation are going to be profitable, but at the same time, the um, uh, bad debt that the system is gonna lock in is going to be uh, minimized. And of course, with the CDP protocol, pricing is key, right? We have collateral and debt, and we have the ratio between those assets as reported by 
in our world, oracles, right? And so trying to square the circle of immutability plus oracles is you know, a challenging problem to begin with, right? Because you're kind of adding this additional dependency to the system um, in addition to the, the collateral and the Ethereum consensus layer. And ideally you'd get that you know, effectively down to the immutable things with the Ethereum consensus layer. Um, and so we actually really liked the liquidity design here, right? And so you have a primary and backup oracle and they're kind of switched between as the source of truth based on a state machine and our interpretation of their status. And so they can be broken or frozen. And you can imagine you, you call back from the primary to the secondary. And then in the acute failure case of both at a given time, you just stick to the last known good price. And as we talked about immutability earlier, um, you know, it's important that the primary oracle is fixed. And so the primary oracle is a fixed address forever. It's actually the concatenation of two chain link feeds, um, one of which we're getting a sped up. And that will be the primary oracle. The backup oracle can be changed via governance, you know, based on what uh, emerges in the ecosystem to, to fill this role the best. Dap, if you also want to help me on this one, but uh, fundamentally we're going to be using STF as the collateral, which means that we're deploying on mainnet, and STF is the only token, so no fee on transfer, weird stuff. And uh, uh, but the interesting aspect that uh, you you want to focus on is the fact that the system will work through shares, which means that let's say you have a balance of one STF. One STF could correspond to, let's say, 0.95 uh, shares of STF. And so the system will track those shares for each CDP. And then because of the protocol yield share, meaning that some of that yield is uh, uh, shared with the protocol as a fee, uh, that means that uh, while your uh, borrow is repaying because your collateral is growing in value, uh, the math uh, uh, will actually mean that the amount of shares that your CDP has reduce over time. And so that's a very delicate aspect of the accounting. So we expect that you're going to be uh, spending some time there. So as we said, your, the value of your position grows because each share is more valuable. And yet the amount of shares that each CDP has reduces over time because of the fact that some of those shares are taken as a fee. Yeah, no, that, that sounds like a great uh, explanation to me. Yeah, of course, this, this core accounting is, is very critical to the system. And, you know, we have the, the rebasing asset, whether it's this or like a vault style asset. Doing this fee split adds some extra nuance there, which really, you know, demands careful consideration. Yeah, uh, to, you know, talking about uh, foot guns, <laughs> the next feature yep. that we added is flash lens. So the reason why we added flash loans is to enable leverage. And basically the EBTC side of the flash loan is actually a flash mint, which means that you can mint EBTC. You can actually mint as much as you want. For each call to the flash loan operation, you're going to mint up to a U112, a 112, but you can call this multiple times. So technically you can mint as much as you want. And uh, you can also flash borrow the STF that is available in the active pool. So that means that as the, act, the active pool could actually have zero balance of STF, but due to the invariants that are maintained, the internal accounting is not going to be broken. And the reason why we allow this is so that you can use, let's say, balancer to swap your asset while you perform the flash loan on the EBTC protocol. Because uh, if you check the balancer code, for example, you cannot both do a flash loan and perform a swap. And so the goal of this functionality is really to enable having the access to that liquidity uh, uh, without having to necessarily, you know, deposit or perform uh, or rely on a third uh, liquidity pool. Yeah, so atomic liquidations and leverage are both really good use cases for flash loans, right? And so another thing that came into play here is we thought about doing leverage, um, you know, one-click leverage type of style, um, with flash loans, you run into the issue of needing to be able to have a contract which can handle, you know, the, the fallback handler for the flash loan sequence there. And so that led to the line of thinking of delegating management. 
Um, so what you can do here is, you know, delegate management of your CDPs to other accounts that can take actions on your behalf, right? They can be either one-time permissions or uh, persistent permissions. Um, position managers can also renounce their own position permission at the end of an operation, like say it needed to take multiple operations as part of the zap action, um, and then kind of reset the allowance, you know, setting your own allowance to zero as the analog to ERC-20 approvals, um, that can happen. And as, as I mentioned, um, flash loan leverage is vastly more efficient um, from an execution standpoint. And there are some other interesting use cases here, which we thought of, which I'll let Alex expand on more. And there's also permit-based approvals here. So these act those can be batched with um, given actions on Zaps. And you know, we anticipate one-click leverage to be a key um, use case there. So Alex, you want to go into the kind of the keeper type services here? Yeah. So the, the main idea, as Dap said, around position managers is to do things that are really hard to do as an EOA and uh, to try and minimize that risk so that you can have either a one-time usage or a continuous usage, or you can also kind of burn that uh, permission. And so a couple of ideas uh, to us that are really interesting, and uh, uh, if you're a, a company and you're interested in offering these services, we're also looking for people to partner with. The, the main ideas that are really interesting will be to target a specific collateralization ratio. And so you could set up a bot uh, through the position managers that is authorized to either top up your position or let's say once you spend some EBTC on your you know, uh, card, uh, there's a bunch of cards, you basically take a little bit more of a loan and you top up your card automatically. That's a good example. And another example that we think is really important will be uh, an emergency closing position. Uh, this will be a custodial service because you have to store the signature, the authorization that allows you to close. But basically, you could have a, a trusted party, you, which could be one of you here in the audience, receiving the signature by uh, some, uh, some person that is using the system. And basically, you could store the signature off-chain. And then in case of an emergency, let's say Crypto Twitter tells you that you have to delever, then now you can use that signature as the position manager to close the position on behalf of somebody else as a way to have that escape hatch. So if you're interested in uh, offering this service, reach out to us. And at the same time, we added those functionality so that those are possible. And um, But at the same time, uh, they, uh, they, they basically provide more service with no particular added risk. Yeah, so position managers really open up the design space of what can be built on top of EBTC and especially allow functionality that would be um, more difficult to achieve for, you know, EOA, MPC wallets. Um, safes can actually be configured with the appropriate callback handlers for the leverage case, but there's still plenty of use cases here as we think about, you know, how EBTC's ecosystem can grow in the future. And another change that uh, is uh, particularly of interest to, uh, to you guys as uh, uh, wardens is the idea of the grace period. So the grace period is a delay before allowing uh, uh, liquidations in recovery mode. So normal liquidations for CDPs that are underwater will be delayed by recovery mode. It can always happen at any time. But for uh, CDPs that are taking a little too much risk, uh, 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 for example, in the scenario of a price swing or in the scenario of somebody just dragging the TCR down for whatever reason, uh, we basically added this grace period as a way to allow people to close their position safely or basically top it up above the critical uh, collateralization ratio as a way to avoid gotchas. And it's a very short delay of 15 minutes we wrote a paper on uh, the finality of Ethereum plus the cost of reorging the chain to demonstrate why this delay is useful. Uh, there's also going to be a gotcha around, around the grace period and how there's a way to miss engaging it or uh, because it, you have to call the contract to start it. Uh, so there's going to be some gotchas there. But at the same time, all we did is that for healthy liquidations that are above 110 CR, uh, we have this 15-minute delay as a way to give people a head start if they want to top up before we uh, uh, liquidate them for the safety of the system. Yeah, so we found this as an interesting way to improve, to maintain the safety of this, that is the intent of this mechanic, while making things a little easier 
um, on, on users and more, more predictable with more ability to react and anticipate changes. And so governance was another key thing that we really revisited from Liquidity. We, from the beginning, you know, we have the design goal here of things need to be fundamentally immutable and non-custodial to borrowers, right? That was a line in the sand and we had to keep that in mind when we thought about each governance feature. And you know, of course, when you lose governance features, you lose flexibility and ability to adapt to the market, right? So it's about achieving the balance there. And so things that are kind of more market-based, um, like the protocol yield share percentage, um, redemptions and the fees around that, and flash loan fees um, are, are up for, for governance. And we you know, went ahead and made these non-essential features, as we call them, or redemptions and flash loans toggleable. Um, for you know emergency situations where these could be misused right in the future, um, changing the the backup oracle is definitely something on deck here, and we we look forward to what solutions emerge in the space that can provide um, an excellent service here. And then also you know EBTC can be expanded in the future via new minting mechanics, right? So you can imagine how like new new types of collateral or mechanics could be built on top of the, the core token there. And, you know, in general, I'll say that the, the governance process itself is out of scope for this review, um, but we'll follow, you know, best practices in the industry. And, you know, there'll be t plenty of time locks and transparency around everything um, with every you know, parameter very well um, justified. Yeah, and so we're going to have a good. giant sort of list thing. of uh, known issues, right? We're going to have yes. a giant list of known Great issues point. and gotchas. So, you know, you don't need to tell us about them, but hopefully we're going to burn all of those permission as soon as possible. And uh, the, the other aspect of the conversation we wanted to have as early as possible is to get you started on invariance. We also have Antonio in the um, uh, audience and uh, we plan on hosting an invariant workshop, uh, but we're going to do it during the contest so that uh, uh, the questions are not going to be you know, how do I get started? Let's answer this question immediately. There's also a one hour video done uh, by Spearbit with, uh, by Antonio with Spearbit that shows you how to get started with invariants. So this is what we got for you. Once you download the EBTC repo, you're gonna have a Docker file. The line number four is docker build dash T my fuzzy. That's gonna build you the Docker image. Line seven is gonna allow you to run the Docker image and then either line 10 or line 13 Line 10 is going to allow you to run Echidna, literally just copy that in the Docker image and that's going to run you Echidna for you. And then line 13 is going to run Medusa for you, which is the, the faster version of Echidna. So if you want to, uh, we, we're going to go deeper in a moment, but basically we have a ton of testing and a ton of invariants and we want you to use them. We're also going to give you broken invariants that we, we have broken and we, I guess we wrote in a way that is incorrect. And the reason why we share them with you is because while they're broken, there is no vulnerability that we were able to find. And so we want you to be in a position where you can find those attacks by setting the state in a place that already breaks some invariants. So uh, the next slide should show you the uh, how to set up handlers. There's going to be a file called target functions. That's a very important uh, file that allows you to kind of set up the functions that are called by both Echidna and Medusa. And so that's a file you're going to have to check. The next uh, slide will show you kind of the before after stateful uh, fuzzing that Antonio set up. It's basically a way to set all of the global state or these ghost variables so that you can compare them before and after as a way to check kind of these uh, before after invariants. And then the next slide will show you instead uh, how to run, let's say, global properties, properties that are checked every time something happens to the system. So I feel like, you know, is the system over collateralized? Is the, uh, are the tokens out there, etc. And so you want to check this file called properties.sol as a way to um, uh, be able to uh, add new invariants. In the next slide, we'll show you the way in which we convert uh, these Echidna uh, bugs to uh, Foundry. Again, uh, Antonio explains that in, in detail in his own workshop, but ultimately, uh, this file called Echidna to Foundry means that once you have a sequence generated by Echidna, you just copy paste all of the names, which are the handlers, you just copy paste them in this file, and you're going to be able to reproduce in Foundry a test case that breaks the invariant, which is shown in the next slide. We call them the debunk 
uh, findings. So this is a test that fails because the invariant is broken, but it's also an invariant that is broken that doesn't have an impact to the system. So uh, you're gonna have access to these files as well that show you uh, all of this setup and it basically allows you to um, um, attack the system from a very interesting starting point instead of having to set everything up. The next slide is kind of the last slide. We'll show you how to get started instead with the foundry testing. The keyword you want to look for is this EBTC base invariance. The EBTC base invariance is the translation of the same invariance for Medusa and Echidna in foundry. They are, we made it so that you, you have to add one line of code to be able to have the invariance from Echidna to foundry. It's literally one line of code. And then for you to get started with any test on Foundry, you can just use the EBTC base fixture, and that's going to allow you to have all of the contracts deployed for you, all of the contracts funded, and all of the utilities that allow you to set up uh, testing uh, in a way that is extremely quick and that leverages the thousands of hours that we put in, into this project. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Antonio is absolutely a wizard with these fuzzing tools. We learned a lot from working together to set up this architecture to do property testing um, in, a, in a way that uses fuzzers rather than formal verification. And we've been really excited about this development and like letting uh, you guys all play with it and get into that, that side of things. And so I can go over a brief architecture diagram, essentially. We really have a few points of entry to the system. We have borrower operations. This is where all your open, close, adjust type of things happen. Um, flash loans versus EBTC. Um, the, the the funds or like the core internal accounting is all consolidated in the active pool. This is where all funds sit. This is where ultimately, um, you know, set total system balances are held. The CDP manager is kind of the point of contact for any data with regards to a CDP, as well as operations that are not from the user, right? And this includes redemptions, liquidations, whether those are full, partial, or or batch liquidations. These two contracts, um, this is just due to size considerations, right? So it's broken up into a storage and common functionality, and some functions from the CDP manager are delegated to the liquidation library. Um, again, just for uh, way, a way of getting around the maximum contract size limitation, which with how this was designed. Um, one thing to note is that sometimes there is collateral surplus from a CDP, like say if it was liquidated and there's an fully liquidated and there's an excess, um, it could go in here or in a redemption as well. And so there's sometimes that users will be able to claim collateral from here and it's kept in an isolated area from the rest of the system um, to not you know, confuse accounting. And then of course there's the EBTC token as well, which isn't documented on here. Um, and then there are a number of periphery con contracts, which we call len lenses in the system um, to provide better views on things that are not necessary to be within the core contracts or architecturally made sense to separate out. Um, we have something called the collateral ratio lens. And this was initially designed to simulate state of synchronizing the accounting because you, as you can imagine, it's like STETH is doing its thing, it's rebasing its state, and we have to synchronize the rest of the system with that, with the price, um, with debt redistrib redistributions, which are something we did not touch on actually, but this we maintain the same debt redistribution logic of liquidity, and if, if a CDP is under collateralized, like say it's at uh, 95%, we still have the 3% premium, and the remaining bad debt um, is kind of socialized amongst all the users, right? And so there's this kind of like pending accounting state with global accrual variables, incrementing accrual variables that need to be updated, and the CR lens provided a way to do that. We eventually added these functions into the core protocol as well with things like, they're called like get synced TCR, get synced ICR, to make that more user friendly and clear to um, users of the system. Multi CDP getter is, is what it's described. It's just a lens contract of concatenating data from multiple CDPs and presenting all of that in a nice format for off-chain use. And hint helpers is, as I mentioned earlier, there's the linked list Right, and so we need to know where to insert in a linked list, and this provides a probabilistic guarantee of a good position um, to insert in the linked list that's still doable on-chain in a fairly efficient manner. Of course, this can be dealt with off-chain as well via something like an indexing serving like a subgraph, but we thought it was important to retain that um, kind of no infrastructure required functionality here. Um, the diamond-like smart wallet was, as I mentioned earlier, we have 
the case of one-click leverage via flash loans. And so we wanted to have a canonical implementation of a smart wallet that could handle this. And its interesting feature is that custom fallback handlers can be set on a per contract basis in a way that is reminiscent of the diamond standard, right? And hence why it's the diamond-like smart, wall, smart wallet. Um, leverage macros are effectively the aforementioned leverage zap logic. Um, and Alex can go a little bit more into those. And then we have uh, the synced liquidation sequencer, which essentially generates sequences of things to liquidate because you can liquidate in a batch. Um, during a batch liquidation, things that aren't actually liquidatable are just skipped. Um, but this allows you to, to come up with those lists in a more convenient way. So uh, just so jumping in. Suggest, uh... Sorry, you go, Alex. Yeah. Yeah, no, I want you to do that. Just go to the last slide, which answered the other question, and then we'll take questions, and then we can talk forever about uh, about the, the the periphery. All right. So this is the information everyone is waiting for. You know, the purple pill is available. Started next week, October twenty third. We have a flat hundred k high medium pot, and then a thirty k formal verification pot as well. Um, to you know, take the properties that we generated with the fuzz setup apply those through Sertora's prover, use the CVL to write them out, audit those, come up with new properties, verify them, disprove them, have them go through the mutation testing, all that great stuff. Um, and there's a cheat sheet here, which has a link of all the things we're consolidating, including what Alex mentioned, um, of you know all these known vulnerabilities or potential issues or gotchas, and um, you know, just a lot of the documentation and research that we put in along the way to get to this point, you know, to make sure that everyone has has that context and understanding to to speed up your own understanding of the system. I think that answers uh, Mr. Potato Magic's question, but um, Alex or Dap, if you have any other resources that you'd recommend studying pre-contest, um, I'm sure that they'd, they'd appreciate it as well. Sure, so we will get the cheat sheet over to you. And then when the, when the code is revealed, we'll make sure that is available too. Awesome. And then we've got one more question. I know we touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, the question is, can you highlight the main differences between ABTC and the liquidity model? Are there any points of special attention for wardens? Yes, definitely. Um, and I, I think the, the special point of attention would be the STE as collateral and you know dealing with this type of asset that rebases or changes in value and splitting the yield between different sources. This is definitely a, a key fundamental accounting change that's important to look at. As far as going through the changes, um, these are a lot of them. That's actually incidentally the first one. Important, the availability of flash loans, the availability of the having these delegates or position managers to perform operations on behalf of users. The way liquidations work, moving from the stability pool model to this open market dynamic liquidation premium, um, the governance features, of course, the grace period on the recovery mode and how that operates, um, those definitely come to mind as key, you know, high level mechanical changes to the protocol. Alex, do you have anything else that you'd uh, add to that list? All right, so I am happy to go into any other things here. We had a couple other slides. Um, what do you think, RMS? Yeah, yeah, I'll, um, I'd encourage anyone else who has questions to drop them in the chat as we go. Otherwise, I'll hand it back over to Dap. Sure, yeah, sounds good. Um, I think one interesting thing from this is the deployment process, right? And we have circular dependencies, meaning that multiple contracts in that architecture diagram depend on the address of another. However, they are mutable. And we wanted to obviously use immutable variables to cut down those gas costs considerably. And so in order to um, kind of square this circle of having things which have to be ordered in a certain way to know about each other, um, we ended up using a create three deterministic deployer so we know where things will be pre-deployment. Um, and you know, there might be some exciting Easter eggs in the deployment um, going forward. Alex, did you have anything else you wanted to to go into in particular? I know there's a lot of different directions we can take it, and part of that's going to be based on um, questions from the warden as we plan out, you know, what our future 
um, sessions are, are going to look like and what's most interesting to you guys. Have we lost, have we lost Alex? Me? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, is it just me or are we not hearing Alex? Oh, there he goes. All right, so I guess I'd, I'd ask again if anyone has any particular questions to go into. Um, I'd say the two broad topics we are planning to go into in future um, presentations are kind of deep dives into different aspects of the protocol. We've produced some videos on these, um, and, you know, between the video um, with some additional kind of like diagrams and resources and examples to go along with them, we think it will help, you know, speed up that deep dive understanding of the protocol. And so that's in the works. Um, we also could do a deep dive on the invariant side. I see Antonio, the wizard himself, in the audience here as well. And looks like Alec is back. Yeah, so let me, yeah, can you hear me? Yep, sounding good. Yeah, so the, I mean, as uh, Dap was saying, uh, we wanted to do two additional workshop. One, in which we dive deep into the code. The code is going to be open source soon, most likely. We're going to say that it's, it's going to be by the contest, but probably earlier. And there's also going to be the testnet uh, Dap. Uh, but uh, uh, we basically have a uh, invariant workshop uh, uh, in plan, uh, and we also have a deep dive of the code uh, as uh, planned workshops where we will host them during the contest so that if, if you have co uh, questions during the contest, there's going to be those two times to answer them and to go through some specific advice. So we wanted to poll kind of the audience if you have preference on doing the invariants first, or if you wanted to do the code deep dive first. We also have videos in the cheat sheet that already cover um, the vast majority of the uh, code or at least a part of it. So, but we're interested in getting some feedback there. And uh, the, the other thing we could show really quickly in this call is a couple of ideas around the leverage macro and the diamond like, which are kind of more of a external uh, periphery contracts that are um, like kind of these interesting contracts that we may not even end up deploying, but that we kept in scope as a way to allow integrators to offer that. Uh, for example, Nosis could have the, you know, the EBTC integration, and it will be probably inspired by something that we are uh, um, securing in this contest. So, so if that's okay, Dap, I would ask you to click on the mirror for, uh, from the cheat sheet. Let's do it. And we can talk about the diamond like really quickly. It's something that um, it's really, I think it's going to be used by a lot of uh, people in the future. And it's simply the idea. So why is it diamond like? It's simply the idea that we took the diamond storage, and which means that there's no clash on uh, slot zero, etc. cetera. Uh, if instead you were um, using noses to accept the callback, and you were delegate calling into an implementation, then uh, the likelihood of a storage clash is very high. Whereas if you use the diamond storage, you're not going to have any clash, which means that the amount of contracts you can use as modules, as implementation, as callback handlers, as we call them, uh, is actually really high. So that's why it's called diamond. Let's scroll down. We'll see that the other piece of the wallet is actually a DS-like. This is from uh, DAP Tools. Uh, so this is more of a noses slash maker inspired uh, piece of code. We ultimately just allow you to specify any call. So this is as the simplest uh, uh, smart contract wallet you can ever write. It's just a list of operation that you execute. And uh, as the comment says uh, above, it's like, if you don't know what, you, what these are, do not use this. This is a, a very easy to get wrecked. But the interesting thing we did is, if you scroll down, is we added this safe by default idea, which uh, in the fallback is, is should be shown. We basically have this fallback function on the bottom left that has, um, first of all, it has to deal with the diamond-like uh, storage. So we have to get the storage by getting the pointer to it. And then the second thing is this uh, second block. If you can zoom more on the left, up, uh, only the text on the left. Uh, we basically have these, uh, the um, callback disabled by default. You can enable the callback only as part 
I mean, you can enable callbacks by set, uh, changing the setting, but by default, you can enable the callbacks only if your first uh, call in the execute loop is a call to yourself that enables the callback for the next caller. And so that's safe by default. And then the way we handle implement, the implementation is very similar to how a, a diamond uh, contract works, where we have a facet, you basically have a, a message.signature. Through the message.signature, if you set up a callback handler, we will delegate call to it, effectively making it so that, uh, you know, your nose is safe, can basically allow a flash loan callback. So you can uh, do a set of operation. And then there's stuff on the right is simply, uh, uh, you know, dealing with the diamond storage, allowing whether you can receive a call or not, and then blocking, you know, blocking from wrecking yourself by, you know, uh, preventing your setting a callback handler on functions that exist, which you don't want to do that. So that's really what the diamond like is. And it basically allows you to have the easiest way to uh, set up uh, a, wallet that allows leverage. Uh, let's go and check. Uh, um, I have a question by JCK. Do you want to type it or? Uh... Yeah, I just invited them to speak. Um, I will say yeah. if they type it instead. And uh, if, uh, yeah, if, uh, in the meantime, I guess we can show kind of the um, leverage macro instead. The, the, um, the leverage macro has one gotcha, and it's that in handling, um, if you perform multiple swaps with this contract, uh, because of the fact that you have to send all of the call data at the beginning of a transaction, uh, you may have some dust amounts. So please refrain from sending us that, we know. Uh, but basically, the leverage macro allows you to take on leverage. And uh, it's actually fairly complicated to get started with. So I'm just gonna give kind of the, the high level and then in the next workshop, we can uh, talk about it more. But you start by calling the do operation um, function and the do operation allows you to either do a flash loan of STF, a flash loan of EBTC or no flash loan. And uh, uh, after that, we're gonna have some you know validation and uh, we allow you to send some tokens to start from. And we also have this validation for uh, uh, setting up a CDP, but effectively we just set up the wallet. And then we have the more interesting aspect, which is the second block down here, which is the flash loan. And anytime you, you work with a flash loan, you have to remember that now the execution is not gonna happen. Like the code below, the handle operation, the lines below are not gonna happen uh, for a while because we're gonna do the flash loan and then handle the, co the callback of the flash loan. And so if you go on the right, that you'll see that uh, the, the the way we handle the flash loan is we receive a on flash loan, obviously, we receive the callback. And then the callback is handled by this function called handle operation, which based on all of this data will allow to specify uh, which callback to use. And uh, all of these structs contain um, uh, what are effectively uh, arbitrary checks. They basically allow you to check for a greater than, a less than, or an equal balances and maybe we'll show that uh, in a moment but let's scroll down to the 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 the, the more uh, logical path and so what you see is that at the end of the entire callback so after we've done uh, the flash loan and after the flash loan flash loan has come back and we have uh, opened the cdp or adjusted it or closed it then there's going to be these post check types and if you go and check what the post operation check is you'll see that it effectively allows us through the function called do check value type, it allows us to compare a value of reference, as in a value we pass through call data, to a value that we actually have, such as a balance. And so this abstraction allow us to say, uh, did you? Uh, so let's say you wanted to have a, a min out check. Well, now you're gonna write something like check the expected debt to be GT or GTE or LT or LTE of what the value is. And so by having this kind of abstraction, we ultimately allow through a, a wallet, uh, sorry, for, for a smart contract, we ultimately allow to take a flash loan, do an arbitrary operation, which is something we haven't shown, but the swap is completely arbitrary. You can call one inch cow swap, you can call anything you want, and uh, maybe it's not in the code, I forgot, but basically that's the thing in the middle. And then in the callback, 
we have all of these checks as a way to be as flexible as possible while still using what is effectively a completely hard coded ZAP. So, you know, to, from my perspective, the leverage macro is basically the most, I guess, is the most guided ZAP that is uh, allowing a, a, a flash long callback, but at the same time, it allows as, uh, as close as it gets to arbitrary operations. And so I guess to kind of uh, bring the point home, the first part of our presentation was all related to the core, to liquidity, uh, or the liquidity fork and EBTC. And then the second uh, part here is more on the periphery. And so you'll see that on the periphery, there's also uh, a lot of stuff to uh, check. Uh, that is also fairly interesting um, uh, because it tries to be abstract and it tries to kind of, um, you know, be, be useful. Yep, arbitrary operations and post conditions. And we envision like the use of position managers through Zaps to look a lot like this, right? Of allowing things to happen, but confirming the results afterwards and have them be kind of one time approvals that are, you know, renounced by the by the Zaps themselves. Yeah, the, this is really the, the interesting fact is we are kind of open sourcing this tech and having it uh, reviewed, but ideally we will never deploy a diamond-like nor, nor a leverage macro. Ideally we have uh, a, another party, let's say, you know, InstaDAP or whatever, uh, offer that um, uh, as a service because our, our main goal is to secure the primitive and make sure that that can be used. And then people can build on top of it, uh, you know, through a multitude of uh, operations. And this is an example of how a uh, integration for leverage will be built uh, in a way that allows anybody to uh, deploy their own leverage contract because the leverage macro can be deployed through the uh, leverage macro factory. So you own your own ZAP and then the ZAP can uh, open a CDP uh, and basically own it. And then uh, that way you have a um, one way of interacting with the system. And then another way will be to use the position manager, which open the CDP for you. So you are taking the debt and then you have the CDP and you can, you can manage it. And so those are kind of different shades of how to interact with the core primitive, which is, uh, you know, the ultimately the, the, the ratio between uh, debt and collateral. Yep, the core primitive of a native Bitcoin on Ethereum and then a wide periphery of things that can be built around that new primitive. And yeah, we're extremely excited to see how this ecosystem uh, builds out. And so on my end, um, that's everything I had. Alex, did you have any other things you wanted to bring up or do you have any questions? I need to check the uh, Discord here. Yeah, if we have any question, uh, I think we, we are happy to take them. We, in the cheat sheet, there's going to be a ton of resources. And obviously the top resource is gonna be the code we're gonna update that as soon as possible and we'll make sure that that's made public for everybody and then uh, and obviously if we open source the code before the contest um the the coding scope is going to be the one in the contest so you have to consider whatever we share now as a preview it's not going to be part of the scope the scope is going to be defined in the repo from coderina so keep that in mind uh, but we're also going to have a test net so that you you're also going to be able to use the system and then uh, over time, that sheet, sheet will be updated with uh, um, uh, Falcon links of every type of transaction. So you can see how an open CDP works, a closed CDP works, etc. And uh, there's a video tour link as well. And it's going to be a folder with videos that explain the majority of the code, how they work, etc. And over time, uh, as we get more questions, we're going to be recording more tours. So that way uh, you can we, you basically have the developer walkthrough of uh, all of the lines of code, what they're meant to do, et cetera, as a way to uh, use them. And the last thing of the resources is just a bunch of Python. There's a math simulation. There's a ton of math there. If you want to check and attack the model from an economic standpoint, if you want to demonstrate the liquidations are unprofitable or whatever, there's uh, a ton of uh, Python that you can fork and you can um, use to then uh, simulate your attacks as well at that level.
Awesome. So I'll put out a last call for questions in the chat. Otherwise, I think we could probably wrap up. This has been great, guys. Yeah, no, sounds great. Thanks for bringing up the, the testnet side. I neglected to, to mention that. And yeah, these resources will expand. Um, and we have reports from Ristow as well and pre previous audit reports to, to dig into to understand how things have evolved. Yeah, we'll prepare the next presentation based on questions. So either DM us or uh, drop them uh, in a, I'm sure they'll make a Discord channel as soon as the, uh, they announce the contest. So if you drop those questions there, that way the next presentation will be tailored to that. Awesome. Looks like we are good on the questions. So we will circle back for the next session. All right, it sounds great. Yep, thanks everybody. Thank you, Ray. This been this has been thanks so good. Us. In the arena. See you in the arena. Nice.